Hello, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning from wherever you're located. Welcome to Columbia at Home. Um, for those of you who joined us before, welcome back. For those of you who are joining us for the new time, for the first time, if you're a current student, welcome. We're so glad you're taking advantage of this opportunity to hear and learn from a member of your alumni network. We hope you'll take advantage of more opportunities to connect with Columbia's alumni community by signing up for the See You There list. That's the best way to learn about upcoming programs and events. We'll drop the sign-in link in the chat. After the presentation, we'll take audience questions. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many as we can in the time allowed. Now to today's program. Bill Grodin has spent more than 15 years in the corporate world. He's currently a director of portfolio management at Monroe Capital, a $13 billion asset manager specializing in private credit. He got the idea for his book, Just Tell Me What I Need to Know, through managing dozens of young professionals and noticing that while they have never been better prepared to handle the technical elements of their career, no training manual or employee handbook provided them with guidance on the soft skills they needed for career success. He'll share some of that guidance with you today. Bill received his bachelor's degree from the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University and his MBA from Columbia Business School. Now I'm pleased to welcome Bill Grodin to Columbia at Home. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Donna. I'm really excited to be here today, and thanks to all of you for joining me this evening. As Donna mentioned, my name is Phil Grodin. I'm a 2013 Columbia Business School alum, and I'm the author of the book, Just Tell Me What I Need to Know, which teaches young professionals the keys to early career success. As a reminder, if you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom. To begin, I'd like to first talk about why I'm here today. New and young professionals have never been better prepared to enter the workforce from a technical perspective. That's a testament to schools offering more relevant coursework and companies providing more robust training programs. When it comes to the soft or people skills, however, it's a different story. As a manager, I see young professionals make the same mistakes over and over again. It often takes years for them to figure out what managers actually want them to see. Why is that? It's not because these skills are complicated or require a graduate degree, because they haven't been taught until now. This evening, I'm gonna teach you how to become a trusted team member and to get your manager to invest in your career by meeting your mentor and your champion. A mentor who will push you to constantly improve and help build out your skill sets a champion who will fight to get you the best opportunities and eventually those coveted promotions. There's nothing theoretical in here. We'll only cover the practical concepts that will directly impact your career trajectory. With that, let's start by quickly walking through the differences between technical and people skills. There are really two types of the necessary career skills. The first, as I said, is technical. These are things like finance, technology, marketing, or accounting. You probably spent four years in school learning these skills, and that's been supplemented with on-the-job training. So we don't need to cover those today. What we are gonna focus on are the people skills, like communication, relationship building, problem solving, and critical thinking. These are vital to building a successful long-term career, but have historically been learned on the job through painful trial and error. So let's talk about the three areas that managers want to see from you most. It doesn't matter what industry or job function you're in. The first is competence, which is more than just getting things right. Yes, it starts with minimizing mistakes, but competence is more than that. 
about being an active and engaged team member. And we'll talk more about what that means. The next is attitude. People should enjoy working with you. Having a good attitude is probably the easiest thing you can do. Intelligence will only take you so far. No one wants to work with someone with a bad attitude. And finally, curiosity. Always looking to learn more. Are you satisfied with your skill set or do you want to keep pushing yourself to grow? This is where you can really set yourself apart from your peers and get people interested in helping you build your career. Today, we're going to dig deeper into why these three areas are so important, and I'll share some of the more essential skills for each of them. Okay, let's start with competence. I can tell you that I struggled with this concept as a new professional. I was treating my work like a school project, which just needed to be accurate and turned in on time. Then a manager gave me a piece of feedback that literally changed everything for me. He said, Realize that it's your job to make everyone else's job easier. I've passed this along to a number of young professionals, and I've always seen a positive impact. Let's bring this to life with a common scenario. I'll ask a team member to complete a simple analysis, and what I get back is an unformatted Excel file that's difficult to decipher, like the one you see on the screen. The math in the table is technically correct, but they could have taken it to the next step to make it clearer like this. Top young professionals take the time to organize everything in a way so that managers can quickly get to the point. Before sending anything out in the future, first ask yourself, how can I make this easier for the reader? This is what competence is all about, and your manager will appreciate you taking the initiative and saving them a bunch of time. Today, we're gonna to walk through three of the more important skills and competence. How to effectively present your findings, what to do when you don't have the information needed to complete a task, and why is context so important? One of the most important elements of competence is the ability to present effectively. If you can't communicate in a clear and concise way, the work behind it becomes meaningless. There are really two elements to a successful presentation. First is how you present, which includes things like volume, pace, energy, and body language. There are resources out there to help you like this with books and on-the-job training. Also spend time watching the better presenters at your company. Start to emulate what they do. These are important skills and will become even more critical over time. Today, however, I want to talk about what you present, which is where I see most young professionals struggle. I'm going to show you how to take an average presentation and turn it into a great one. Let's start with an example. You've been tasked with researching a potential cost-saving initiative for your company. You've done the research and you're in the meeting to present the options. You start by saying, after speaking with the vendor, there are three options we can choose. The silver plan will cost $5,000 to take one month to implement, to save the company $10,000 a year. The gold plan will cost $10,000, will take three months to implement, will save the company $20,000 a year. The platinum plan, I'm sure I've lost all of you by now. And if you were giving this presentation, you would have lost the audience as well. It's not uncommon for people early in their career to come into a presentation and simply rattle off a bunch of facts. These facts might be important, but as I'm sure you just experienced, it was very hard to understand what I was talking about and process that information. So let's discuss how you can make this a great presentation. First, rather than just facts, tell the story. You do this by structuring the presentation with a beginning the purpose or why you completed the project, a middle, your process and what you've learned, and an end, your recommendations. You may be wondering why you need to introduce the topic if it's just your manager and team members. Even if everyone is aware of the project, they have a lot going on and may not remember exactly what you're working on. I can't tell you how many times a member of my team 
started presenting and I had to stop and ask them what the topic was. Provide slides or handouts. Especially when dealing with a lot of numbers and information, create a table that summarizes everything in a clear and concise way. Use facts for support. Facts are important and shouldn't be ignored, but they should only be there to support the presentation. And finally, make a recommendation. You need to take a stand. Young professionals are often hesitant to do this, but it'll push you to focus on the big picture and be more than just a fact gatherer. So let's take everything we just learned and apply it to the example we started with. I'm here to talk about the different options for the cost saving initiative we've been working on. Spoken with the vendor, and there are three options which you can see on the screen. While the platinum plan clearly results in the greatest savings for our company, we have a strict four month deadline, so I recommend we go with the gold plan. This will result in $20,000 of annual cost savings and even gives us a one month cushion in case the project gets delayed a week or two. You see how much clearer that was? I start by reminding everyone what the project was, then I show all the data on the slide, but only talk through the relevant information that informs my recommendation. Even if someone walked into the room with no prior knowledge, they would be able to understand the project and know the best path forward. The last point I wanna make here is that while this example was for a verbal presentation, all of it applies to written communication as well. I have a great example of this in my book where I walk through how to compose the perfect email summarizing information like this. Now I wanna talk about how you can complete projects when you don't have all the information. This can be one of the hardest transitions from college to the workplace. It's a new experience for all of us. While in school, your teacher made sure you had everything you needed to complete the task. In the professional world, however, you're gonna run into difficult situations where you don't have everything you need to make a decision. I'll share a good example from early on in my career as a consultant. We had just signed up a new client and our team needed to value the damages associated with a fire at their warehouse. They sent over a package of their financial information and it was my job to calculate those damages. While putting together the analysis, I noticed that they hadn't provided a number of critical pieces of information, like what they expected next year's sales to be. I went to my manager to let her know about the missing data and talk about next steps. She told me that we couldn't ask for any additional information and had to complete the project as is. I went back to my desk feeling dejected and lost. But what do you do here? First, assess what you need. It's common in situations like this <clears throat> for young professionals to get a little frazzled. If you don't know exactly what's missing, it'll be impossible to come up with a solution. So start by making a list. Then look for precedent. Issues like this pop up all the time. And there's a good chance a coworker might have some advice. So ask around. Then make assumptions, but document how you came up with them. There have been countless times in my career where I've asked a team member how they came up with their assumptions, but they can't remember. Finally, walk through those assumptions with your manager and see if they have any comments or ideas. Going back to my example, I created a list of the missing information, asked my teammates for advice, made assumptions and documented them, and then spoke with my manager. She was happy to go through it with me and made some minor adjustments. The project was completed on time and resulted in a favorable outcome for our client. Like I said earlier, getting comfortable with the unknown isn't easy in the beginning. It's important to have a process in place so you can take the project as far as possible. There's a big difference between coming to your manager with a bunch of problems and offering a potential solution. Now let's talk about how failing to provide context can turn even the simplest task into an issue. This is one of the most common missteps I see from young professionals, but the good news is it's really easy to fix. 
let me first explain what I mean by context with a story from my career. It was my first week on the job as a consultant. My group had just begun working with a new client. We were doing a full review of the, the client's financial performance. And the first step of the project was to analyze their cost structure. My manager asked me to email the client's CFO and request the income statement for the last three years so we could get started. I typed out this email and sent it off with my manager copied. Tom, please send the company financials. After hitting send, my manager almost immediately responded to the CFO and explained exactly what we needed, how it was going to fit in the broader project. Later that day, my manager and I sat down and she walked me through what I had missed. She explained that the email wasn't clear and now Tom would have a bunch of questions. First, he's wondering, who is this? I've never met Tom before. So he might think this email was just spam or some other request that isn't worth his time. Next, what exactly does he need? Asking for the company financials is a very broad request. It could mean a bunch of different things. He'd now have to clarify with me to ensure he's sending the right information. Why does he need it? This is important because Tom might have a better idea of where we could get started. Like maybe they put together a specific cost analysis his team has already put together. When does he need it? Without a deadline, he may file it away for later and then forget about it. So here's what I should have written. Hi, Tom. I'll be working with Sarah on our upcoming engagement together. To get started, would you mind sending over the company's income statement for the last three years? so we can start to analyze the cost structure. To stay on our timeline, we'd like to get started with the analysis on Thursday. Please let us know if you won't be able to send the information by then. Now Tom knows the following. He knows who I am, since I referenced my manager, Sarah, who Tom already knows. He knows exactly what I need, so he doesn't have to guess or clarify. He knows why I need it, in case he has a better place to get started, and he knows when I need it, so he doesn't miss our deadline. As I said earlier, this is a very common issue for young professionals. So take the time to always provide the context. Context is also no less important for verbal communication. So apply the same lessons when talking directly with people. I can guarantee that your manager will notice this and will appreciate your ability to handle these requests without their assistance. Now, I want to move on to attitude. You'll quickly notice that your job is just more fun when you like the people that you're working with. A lot of young professionals get so caught up trying to be the best or rise the fastest that they forget that business is about people and relationships. Intelligence and hard work are important, but it's really hard to succeed in the workplace if you're no fun to be around. We're going to talk about some of the most common ways I see young professionals mismanage their career. We'll start with the most basic aspect of the attitude, which is showing some personality. Then we'll talk about keeping your composure in stressful situations, what to do when things don't go well, how to deal with difficult people, and finally, why you shouldn't treat your career like a race. Attitude starts with personality. Unfortunately, one of the most common complaints I hear about young professionals is how robotic they can be. They rarely show emotion and it's impossible to even know if they like what they're doing. But I can certainly relate. When I was a young professional, I was often the only junior person in the room. I felt very insecure around all these accomplished executives and I was only concerned with not looking immature. Anytime the team was joking around, I'd be polite, but stoic. In my book, I actually share a story where I got this exact feedback. And after putting it into place, I received a career changing opportunity. Acting like a robot will prevent that from happening. Your company hired you because they believe you'd be a good cultural fit. So it's okay to be yourself. Of course you need to be professional but recognize that relationship building starts with showing people who you are. Get excited when good things happen. 
show enthusiasm for your work. Later, we'll talk more about the power of building your network, but you can't do it when people have no idea who you are. So now we know that it's okay to open up to our team, but recognize that that's not an invitation to break down during stressful times. One of the tenets of having a good attitude is always keeping your composure. Look, I remember how hard it is to be a young professional. While you're learning how to do everything for the first time, you're also expected to churn out work product after work product. You have multiple projects at the same time, maybe even multiple managers. Sometimes things can get especially crazy with a tight deadline where you're expected to step up in an uncomfortable position. The key though, is to always keep your composure. You want your manager to be confident that they can trust you, especially in difficult situations. I'll share an example from my career, how I handled a particularly stressful time. When I was a junior investment banker, I was busy closing a merger between two multi-billion dollar healthcare companies. It was a Thursday night and we were planning to announce the merger the following morning. <clears throat> the rest of the team had gone home for the evening and I was in the office alone, finishing up some final prep work for the announcement. Suddenly my phone rang and it was the managing director from the investment bank that represented the other company. Apparently, there was a mistake in the calculation that determined how many shares each company would get in the newly formed entity. He walked me through the mistake and he asked me to sign off on the change. This would literally move tens of millions of dollars from our client to theirs. For some context, I had exactly nine months of investment banking experience. And because the project was on such a short timeline, I was working on a completely different work stream and I'd never even seen this calculation before. Needless to say, it was complicated and I had no idea if he was right. I told him I'd have to call him back after checking with my team. Unfortunately, my manager who built the calculation wasn't answering his phone or email, so I was on my own. I looked around the office and there was no one there to help ask for help or guidance. I got up from my desk and I took a lap around the office and grabbed some water to clear my head. Then I sat down, took a deep breath, and slowly taught myself how the calculation worked. When I finally felt confident that I understood it, I called the lead banker on my team at his home. I calmly and slowly walked him through the issue and explained why I agreed with the other banker's assessment. He gave me the green light to accept the change I called up the other banker and we successfully announced the merger the next morning. Whether you're feeling stressed, overwhelmed, or just can't figure something out, always keep your composure. Managers need to know that they can count on you, especially in difficult situations and getting out of, getting out of sorts can shake their confidence in you. Here are my tips that have helped me get through these difficult times. First, Step away. Your mind is probably racing in a thousand different directions. You'll be no good to anyone in this state. <clears throat> if you have the time, take the night off and meet up with a friend or walk over to a colleague's desk and have a 15 minute conversation. In my example, I only had time to walk around the office, but it helped me get started. Next, get organized. You might be feeling overwhelmed because there's so many different things going on. Make a list so you can see exactly what needs to get done. Then prioritize. If you're truly overloaded and can't do everything, go to your manager and show them what you can and can't do under their deadline. Maybe they can push something back or reassign something to another team member. Finally, realize that everyone goes through times like these and they will pass. After living through difficult situations like my banking story, you start to build your confidence and feel like nothing can save you. Now we know how to deal with stressful times. Let's talk about what to do when things just don't go your way. This can mean a bunch of different things. Making a mistake, 
didn't know the answer to a question, a missed deadline. Nobody likes to talk about this. But even if you're a top performer, how you handle yourself here will be crucial to your career success. That's how important it is. If you follow this advice, you can actually turn a bad situation into a good one. First, take responsibility. No excuses, no blaming others, just say that was my bad. I still do this all the time, and guess what? We all move on and forget about it. If you don't take responsibility, you're only gonna make it a bigger issue with your manager and you could end up burning a bridge. Next, learn from it. You made a mistake, don't know how to correct it. Either ask for help or let your manager know that you're gonna go try to figure it out. If you're on a tight timeline, make sure you're upfront with your manager so you don't miss a deadline. If your manager is asking you for a piece of information and you don't know the answer, just say, I don't know but I'll come back to you with an answer. That's a common phrase that managers and even CEOs use all the time. Don't try to guess. Your manager will still realize you don't know and will then start to question if they can trust you. If you think you might miss a deadline, always communicate that to your manager as soon as possible so they can plan accordingly. Finally, don't do it again. Once you've learned from a mistake, Commit it to memory or put it on a sticky note on your desk so it doesn't happen again. No one is perfect, but if you're paying attention, you'll see that most successful and confident leaders quickly admit fault when something goes wrong and then move on. Now let's turn to how to deal with difficult people. This is not easy to do, but if you can master this, managers will take notice. Today, we're specifically gonna talk about difficult people who are not on your team. Maybe it's another group in the company or a client. These people often miss your deadlines or completely ignore your requests. Just generally make your life harder. So let's start with a cartoon to illustrate what most people do. They stay away. Or they continue to send emails with the same request. Fortunately, this is just not the answer. Difficult people don't just go away. So what should you do? You need to start building relationships with these people. I'd like to share a story from my career that best illustrates this concept. I was working at a client site for a distressed company during the Great Recession. As you can imagine, morale was at an all-time low, and it made our job that much harder. There was one employee in particular, Frederick, who worked in the accounting department and was responsible for sending us the financials each month. He was always late delivering them and that made it difficult for us to complete our work on time. He would repeatedly ignore our follow-up emails, so I thought it was best to talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, see if there's anything I can do. I went over to his cube, but heard him talking with someone else. It seemed that they were discussing the popular TV show at the time, Lost. It was apparent by his enthusiasm that Frederick was really into the show. I waited patiently out of view until his conversation ended, and then I walked up to him. His smile and positive energy immediately disappeared when he saw me. I was going to jump in about the financials, but I figured I would try a different approach. I was also a fan of the show and figured it would be good to build some rapport. It was currently the final season and everyone was trying to guess how it would end. So I mentioned that I overheard him talking about the show and asked if he had any theories. His energy immediately sprang back and he spent the next 15 minutes walking me through his theory. We ended up talking for an hour about Lost, other TV shows and God knows what else. At the end, I was tempted to casually mention the financials but I didn't want to kill the moment. We ended up talking after each episode ended and became friendly. And like magic, the financials just started arriving on time. A few months later, Frederick actually confided in me that he was scared to lose his job because there had been layoffs in the past and so many people were looking for work. When we arrived, people were angry because it added to their already unmanageable workload 
and they were nervous that we could recommend more layoffs. In the end, our team actually helped the client navigate through the crisis and no more layoffs were required. Me and Frederick keep in touch to this day and he's still at that company. So let's talk about what I did there. And I'll also provide some more helpful tips to deal with difficult people. Rather than continuing to press Frederick for what I wanted, I spent some time focused on him. This can be a great way to diffuse difficult people. In these situations, I start by finding out what they're interested in and I give them a platform to talk. Maybe it's a favorite team, TV show, travel, restaurants, whatever. Another common tactic that I use is I figure out if I can help with the request in some way. When asking someone for data, create a template so they just have to fill in the number. Deadlines can also be an issue. Work with the person to come up with a reasonable timeline that works for both of you. The important thing is to stop thinking about yourself and start recognizing that they're people too and have the same needs that everyone does. They want to be heard and they want to be respected. Not every situation will turn out like me and Frederick, but if you stay positive, make the conversation about what they need, you'll be surprised how many difficult relationships will turn into positive ones. As I mentioned earlier, this is a skill that's difficult for most people, not just those early in their careers. If your manager sees you disarming difficult people in the office, they will instantly start to think about you as a potential future leader. Now, getting to that leadership position can be great, but recognize first that it's not a race. When I was 22, however, I looked like one of these people at the starting line. I said to myself, by the time I'm 35, I'm going to be the youngest managing director in the company's history. I learned, however, that's not the right way to build your career, but I understand it can be tempting to be competitive. There's more pressure than ever with social media, everyone posting their accomplishments online, and it's hard not to pay attention. But focusing on what everyone else is doing will only slow down your progression. I've seen young professionals stay in jobs they hated because they didn't want to start over or miss an upcoming promotion. I've seen young professionals take on more they can handle and have it blow up in their face. And I've seen young professionals live in denial rather than admit that they need help. Here are some tips that will help you avoid making those common mistakes. First, see your peers as resources rather than competition. There's a story in my book about a fellow new hire and my first job who was outperforming all of us. Rather than make up excuses or get frustrated, he became a resource who helped me grow. On the other side, help others when you can. There will be times when you're ahead be open to help others, but be patient with them. You may have to walk them through it a number of times. Don't get frustrated and don't just do their work for them. Teach them. Managers will notice when you help others and they will start to feel comfortable with you leading a team. Everyone on the team can win. I oftentimes see young professionals feel like they have to stand out on a project. When the project goes well, everyone on the team shares the victory. Finally, focusing on rising to the top as quickly as possible can result in missed opportunities. To illustrate this point, let me first show you how I thought my career was going to go, and then I'll show you my actual career path. First, here's what I thought my career path would be when I was 22. I figured if I got promoted every two or three years, I'd be on my way to managing director by 35. But here's what really happened. As you can see, my career has taken a lot of twists and turns. I want to point out two areas where I could have taken the shortest route to the top, but didn't because I saw more value in pivoting. After five years of consulting, I was ready for a promotion to manager, but I decided to go to business school instead to build out my leadership skills and my network. For two years, I had an unbelievable experience at Columbia Business School, learning a ton, making lifelong friendships, and securing a once unattainable job in investment banking. After a few years as a banker, 
the firm up, opened up an opportunity in the asset management group. In this role, I would be acquiring hedge funds and private equity funds. While it wasn't a promotion, I was suddenly working directly for the most senior people at the firm and engaging with company founders on a daily basis. In this role, I had a front row seat to hear some of the smartest minds in finance talk about their businesses. If I was only focused on the next promotion, I never would have gotten those roles and wouldn't be where I am today. <clears throat> We've now gone through competence and attitude. You can come into work every day doing your job well. With a good attitude, you'll have earned yourself some real job security. But I think we're all looking for more than that. And this is where curiosity comes in. Showing intellectual curiosity will continually push your career into new and exciting places. What this means is always looking to learn more and build out different skill sets. We'll start by talking about how to build a network the right way. Then we'll walk through why a fear of failure can really stunt your career growth. And then finally, I'll show you how meetings can be a source of learning rather than feel like a waste of time. <clears throat> I'm sure you've heard this many times before, but networking truly is one of the most important things you can do to build a successful career. Unfortunately, I don't think a lot of people actually understand how to network the right way. Young professionals often see networking as a way to build up a stable of people who can help them in the future. It's all one way. View your professional network the same way you view your friendships. The stronger the bond you build with someone, the more likely it is you'll help, they'll help you when you need it. And remember, that goes both ways. Let's start with a story that really illustrates the power of networking. It's probably one of the most significant stories from my career. It was 2006, and I was a first year consultant right out of college. I was joining the litigation finance group where I was evaluating damages and litigation cases. It was the most sought after group in the company and very few people ever left. For the first two years, I loved the work and had some unbelievable managers. It would have been very easy for me to stay insulated in my group a lot of my teammates did just that, but I wanted to learn more about our company. At orientation, I had met a fellow new hire who was going to work in the corporate restructuring group, and we became friendly. We would go out to lunch sometimes to catch up on our project, and he started bringing the rest of his team as well. At some point, the head of the restructuring group started noticing me hanging around, and we became cordial. Fast forward to a few months before the Great Recession started, and I was in the office catching up on a few things one Saturday. Suddenly, the head of the restructuring group was standing in front of me. He asked me to come with him, and we went down to his floor. His whole team was assembled, and he explained that our company CEO had personally just signed up a high-profile but incredibly secretive engagement. The group needed resources, and I was being pulled in to help. We worked day and night for a month and got the project done. While it was an intense experience, I learned a lot and really enjoyed the work. I went back to my group and I thought that was the end of it. But once the Great Recession started, the restructuring team was suddenly in great demand. It was their job to help distressed companies navigate through trouble and they couldn't manage all the projects. Our group, on the other hand, was having trouble keeping everyone busy and rumors of layoffs were circulating. One morning, I got a call from the restructuring group head to come down to his office. He explained that they were looking to grow and he wanted me to join the team. Needless to say, I was thrilled and it started my career in the restructuring space that I still work into today. This story illustrates a few important tips when it comes to networking. First, I was genuine. I started networking because I was genuinely intellectually curious about what other groups did in the firm, and I liked making relationships with other people. I oftentimes see young professionals become very awkward when they try to network. Just be yourself and view the experience as developing a friendship, which is organic, rather than building a network which can feel forced. 
Next, don't selectively network. For me, it was just about gaining a lunch buddy and learning more about our company. What I didn't mention in the story is that I had friends like this in every group of the firm. I see this all the time. Young professionals suddenly perk up when someone senior enters the room. They try to get in some precious small talk to build their brand. People will see through this, become suspicious of your motive, and will be less likely to help you in the future. It is and it isn't a numbers game. What I mean by that is the more people you have in your network, the more powerful it is. But connecting to strangers on LinkedIn doesn't count. You want to build real relationships with people. Relationships can also take many different forms. People in your network can benefit you in many different ways. Some have turned into great friends, other into travel partners when I was younger. Don't only view people for their potential to help your career. Surround yourself with decent, fun, and intelligent people, and it will improve your life in other ways. Finally, keep in touch. It can be easy to do this when you work together, but what happens when one of you finds another job? I carve out some time every month to reconnect with people over lunch. I'll shoot them a test if I see something I thought they'd find interesting or funny. The longer you go without talking to someone, the weaker that bond becomes. With networking, the best advice I can give you is just don't overthink it. Go out there and make genuine connections with people, and over time, you'll see benefits in unexpected ways. You try to plan out who you want in your network for specific reasons, it just won't work. Now I want to talk about the common reason young professionals shy away from their intellectual curiosity. It's a fear of failure. First, let's explore why that is. See young professionals treating their career like a test. They receive a task, complete it exactly how they were instructed to do it, and then patiently wait for the next one. Following this strategy will quickly get you pigeonholed into your current role. People will see you as nothing more than a taskmaster, and your career progression will grind to a halt. If you listen to successful leaders, they will all talk about prior failures. The reason for the failures is because they were always pushing themselves to learn more. Here are some tips to help strip away that fear and go for it. First, step outside your comfort zone. I have a good example of this in my book, with a young professional I was working with. Every month, we'd prepare a presentation for senior management. He'd put together the financial data and I'd write the commentary. One month he came to me and asked if he could try to write the commentary himself. Managers love to see this initiative and will understand it won't be perfect the first time. I certainly did. You can only learn so much by watching others. Eventually you need to learn by doing. Next, manage expectations. If it's your first time trying something, ask your manager if you can take a shot at it and then walk through it with them. Make it clear that you want to learn how it can be improved rather than just sending it to them to be graded. Also, don't get frustrated. There will be times when you try something and it doesn't go well. If you show the right attitude and seek to learn and improve, your manager will see this as a positive experience even though it wasn't a great result. Finally, these experiences will accelerate your career in two different but equally important ways. One, this will broaden your skill set and make you a more valuable team member. Two, your manager will take note and start to invest in your career. They will give you bigger and better projects, start to actively coach you more because they know you're passionate about building your brand. Now let's talk about how to extract maximum value from the meeting. It doesn't matter if it's with a big client or a weekly staff meeting. There's always something you can be learning. But in order to learn, there's one thing you have to do first, and that's listen. You can't listen to texting or on social media. You also can't learn if you're working. 
I oftentimes see young professionals with their heads buried in their laptop working on other things during meetings. Some even think that their managers are probably happy to see this because it shows how laser focused they are. But like I said earlier, career success is not just about executing, it's about growing. And a big way to do that is to learn from others. So let's now talk about how listening can positively impact your career. With some meetings, it'll be obvious how they can be valuable learning experiences. Maybe your manager is presenting to a client or your company's management team. Here, learn what the audience is looking for, which will make you more effective at creating deliverables. What about meetings that don't directly impact your day-to-day? -day? There's still a lot of things that can be learned. Like we talked about earlier, effective communication is one of the most important tools for your career. I would also listen to, to presenters and critique their performance. What worked or didn't and why? Becoming a great presenter takes years, and being able to watch others provides you with a great resource to help you improve. Listening carefully in these types of meetings can also give you a better perspective. This is a rare opportunity to learn more about what other people are doing, get a better sense of what's going on in your firm. Finally, by paying attention, you will send an important message to your manager that you care. Managers will take notice when you're following along and your peers all have their heads down typing away. Before we wrap up, I want to leave you with two questions that every manager will subconsciously ask themselves about you. First, can I trust you to get the job done? You can show yourself to be a competent team member. Your manager will begin to trust you. I talk a lot about the power of trust in my book. What does that mean for you? It means more freedom and responsibility. It's the best way to start your career. But like we talked about, there's more to the equation than just competence. I see so many young professionals stop here. They become trusted ex executors, but wonder why their careers have stalled, even though their work product is top notch. Because they ignore the second question that managers will ask themselves about you. Is it worth my time to invest in your career? If you have the right attitude and show a healthy dose of curiosity, your manager will repay you by becoming your mentor and your champion. A mentor who will push you to constantly improve and help you build out your skill sets and a champion that will fight to get you the best opportunities and eventually those coveted promotions. Get people excited about your career with your attitude and curiosity, and you'll be amazed what it can do for you. Before we move to the Q&A, I wanna talk very briefly about my book, Just Tell Me What I Need to Know. If you found this presentation helpful, I highly recommend that you check it out. So with more practical advice and great stories from my career as a young professional manager. On this slide, I provided the QR code and URL for my website. There you can learn about the book, find the Amazon page, and email me your career questions if they weren't answered here today. With that, I'd now like to open it up to your questions. So the first question that I see, how to deal with questions you don't know the answers to or unsure how to answer in the moment? That's a great question and I think I mentioned this earlier, but it's extremely important there to be open and honest and to say, that's a great question and I don't know, but I'm gonna go look it up. It's very common and people understand when young professionals don't know everything. A big part of being new is figuring out how to properly prepare for meetings and to learn what's important. I can remember when I first started, there's so much information and you don't know what's important and what's not. So it can be really hard to be prepared for every question that comes up. So first, like I said, is be honest, so you don't know and tell them you'll get them the answer. But then learn from that. Start to figure out what's important and how you can better prepare for those meetings. So you're not trying to memorize everything. You're getting smarter about what types of questions your manager will ask. Over time, you'll start to notice that as you're preparing for meetings, 
in your head, you're going to hear your manager asking questions before they even happen, because over time, they'll start to learn. There's a question here from Nancy about seeking, uh, seeking mentors. So a lot of companies have formal programs which match you up um, you know, with a coach or, or a mentor, but I think you're probably alluding to more of the organic relationship. I would say, especially in the beginning, this is not something that you wanna say in a formalized setting. You want to really show the three elements that I talked about today. You show competence, attitude and curiosity. If you're constantly asking good questions and wanting to learn more, they're going to start to take an interest in your career and they're going to informally become your mentor. One of the things that I actually didn't talk about today is very common when you're a young professional to work on a specific element of the project and not have the full context of everything that's going on. It's perfectly acceptable and I highly recommend when the time is right, to ask the manager, you know, I'd love to sit down and try to understand how my work fits in with the broader project. I have a really good story about this in my book as well. Um, but doing things like that and showing managers that you actually really care about your job and you really want to learn more, that's what gets them excited in you. And that's when they start to work for you. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing anything sort of formal or, or asking for things like this. But if you follow these steps, you'll quickly see that people will actually want to help you. So I have a question from Julie about dealing with people who are unresponsive or, or passive aggressive in the office. Uh, working in finance, I have dealt with a lot of people like this and it can be incredibly frustrating and difficult. And what I've noticed a lot of young people do is they'll send out emails and then they'll send out another email and another email and they'll just keep following up. And similarly, like I talked about earlier, you, you really want to try to understand it from their perspective and be as helpful as possible. If you can be positive and friendly and helpful, it makes it really hard for them to continue to be difficult. Um, and what I really like to do is build genuine relationships with these people when I don't necessarily need something from them. It makes it really hard for them to be, uh, to ignore you when you suddenly become friends. So like I mentioned earlier, I see a lot of times where there'll be a request, but it, it's really open-ended. If there's a way for you to make it simpler, um, do that for them. If you can send it to them earlier so they have more time to do it, that's great. Um, but what you don't want to do is send a bunch of false deadlines and a bunch of emails where it's all about you. Try to think about it from their perspective, because most likely they're focused on their day job and you need something that's probably not part of their day to day. So you're making their lives a little bit harder. Of course, they're not dealing with it well, but try to be as friendly and as helpful as possible. And you'll be surprised how much easier things will get. I will say in the extremely rare cases where you're just not having the positive impact, I'm not recommending you necessarily, you know, go tell on them to your manager, but if you're truly worried about missing deadlines or about things going wrong, it's extremely important for you to talk to your manager, um, even having potential solutions, asking them if they have any advice, um, because you can't use that as an excuse for you missing your deadlines because other people aren't sending you information. So there's a question from Mervyn about um, recently working on a team project. He found himself doing all the work. What is what is your advice? This is a this is a good question, and I'm not sure if you're in a school setting or in a professional setting. Um, thankfully, I've found personally that this is less likely to happen in a professional setting than in a school setting, but it, it certainly does happen. Um, I would recommend, especially if you're a Type A person, which which is great, and you like to take charge. Um, you, you probably are being extremely constructive and that might be needed for the group, but there are people out there who tend to 
um, be extremely passive. And if they see someone doing all the work, they might just say, great, I can kind of free ride off of this, no problem. If that's the case and you're really taking charge, spend the time to get them engaged, ask them questions about what they're interested in or how they want to help the project. It's very hard for them to answer that question in a negative if you ask them what they would like to contribute. Um, so again, if, if that's the situation, try to get them engaged, ask them questions, see how they can be helpful rather than just simply either trying to assign work or, or just doing everything and waiting for people to chime in. Uh, I think this is probably time for one last question, and this is from an anonymous. How do you talk about mistakes if it wasn't your error? It's a good question, and it, it's a tough situation. Um, you know, it, it's probably a little bit situation specific, but you'll see that if you try to if you try to blame everybody for your problems, it, it doesn't come across well, and you're typically going to burn bridges, especially if it's a small issue. It's probably best just to accept it and move on. That being said, if this is something recurring, so someone's repeatedly making mistakes and making you look bad, don't call them out in the moment, don't call out to their face, but probably sit down with your manager um, when you've kind of cooled down in a private setting and talk them through the situation and ask their advice. Rather than just saying, look, this person is making a mistake and it's not my fault, say, hey, I'm running into this situation, can you help me deal with this problem? That's coming at it from a much more constructive manner rather than, like I said, focusing on the individual mistake and, and who made that mistake. Nick, I wanna be uh, sensitive to time. How are we, how are we doing? Maybe one more question. Last question from you on how to show appreciation to mentors and champions and ma maintain that relationship. Um, be, that's a great question. Be honest with them. Tell them how much you appreciate that. Um, you know, if, if they're giving you an opportunity, uh, I think the first thing you do is show your excitement and deliver. Obviously, you know, the, the performance and the output, they will certainly appreciate that. But then afterwards, it's totally acceptable um, you know, after you, you maybe you presented something big and no one at your level has ever presented that level to, to sit down and say, hey, I just want to let you know how much I really appreciate that opportunity. I really learned a ton and it was a great experience and I'd love to keep doing things like that. And, and I just want you to know how much I really appreciate you looking out for me. So like, like you've probably seen, being open and direct with people is typically the best way to go about it. Um, there's not like a secret sauce or, or a magic formula, but um, you know, especially with managers in good situations like that, just, just be honest with them and let them know how much you appreciate it. I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. Thank you, Phil, so much for joining us this evening. Uh, I certainly took a lot from, from your uh, remarks, and I'm sure everyone else did as well. Uh, thank you as well to all of our attendees. Um, definitely be sure to uh, check out Phil's book, um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great night.